Okay, 1 Peter. This is our New Testament survey class. I am skipping James tonight because in light of my mission trip, I uh, didn't have time to get James together, and I've taught 1 Peter, 2 Peter more recently than I've taught James. So it's easier to go that route, and we'll pick up on James next time. We meet in two weeks. Now, the longer title when I taught this in the past, is the glory of suffering for the Savior. But I dropped the last three words to keep it to four. But it's it's the glory of suffering, which sounds like a contradiction. But not from a divine viewpoint. Not from a divine viewpoint. When you're suffering for the Savior. So open your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And let's get the introduction to 1 Peter like we normally do. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, who is he writing to? To the pilgrims of the dispersion, the diaspora. In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. First of all, again, we see the writer of this letter is Peter. Peter. We're not used to saying that. We're used to saying Paul, aren't we? Peter. Now, now, what does his name mean again? A little rock, right? And, and, and by the way, who, who gave him his name? Jesus. And this is not John 1.4. It's John... 141. I'm going to call you Cephas, a little rock, which is interesting. I remember Don Gray Barnhouse saying years ago, and I don't know if this is absolutely true, but he, would, he said that the word Simon meant wishy-washy, where we get the English word Simonized, Simonized the floor. It was wishy-washy, he says, and he says, you know, you're wishy-washy, but I'm going to make you a rock. And that's what God can do in our lives. (laughs) Jim wasn't, that was Jim's mistake, not mine this time. Okay, number three, how is he described in this verse? An apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle of Jesus Christ. He's part of that select group of individuals that were appointed by Christ, had seen the risen Christ, and had the signs and miracles of an apostle. And again, in the listing of the apostles, Peter is always listed first. Always first. He was like the leader of the pack. How is he, why is he described in this way? To emphasize again his authority. I mean, they're just not trying to use some badge of some kind. They're trying to say, I am an official representative sent on a mission by Jesus Christ, and therefore, in essence, you need to listen to what I have to say. The recipients of this letter are primarily Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians. Now, there are those who think that they are Gentiles, but I would argue otherwise. First of all, Peter's primary ministry was to who? To the Jews, right? Now, that doesn't mean he never preached to the Gentiles, but his primary ministry was to the Jews. How are they described? First of all, they're described as pilgrims of the dispersion. In verse 1, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. The word dispersion is our word for diaspora. Diaspora refers to uh, people who were scattered. In fact, I got off gotquestions.org today. The word diaspora is a transliteration of a Greek word that means to sow throughout or to distribute in foreign lands, or scatter abroad. Some form of the Greek word is seen in six different New Testament passages, and at its simplest meaning, the diaspora refers to Jews who were living outside of Israel, having been dispersed or scattered to other Gentile countries. And I believe that's true. And keep in mind, why were they scattered? Well, one of the reasons they could have been scattered was in yesteryear, you remember what happened in 722 B.C. The Assyrians came and conquered 
Israel, the ten northern tribes, right? And what happened in 606, 605, 586 B.C.? The Babylonians came. And so many Jews were scattered to other countries, and in some cases they stayed in other countries. But keep in mind, historically in the first century, prior to the writing of this epistle, there was a Jewish persecution that caused Jews to flee as well. And that happened before the Christian persecutions began. And so there's good reason, I believe, to believe that he's writing to Jewish Christians. Now, where did they live? Well, verse 1, what does it say again? To the pilgrims of the dispersion. Where? In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia Minor, and Bithynia. And where is that? You have a map there on your handout to assist you. You see where it is? Again, it's very just to, in, in what would be modern-day Turkey again is that very area that is being located, modern-day Turkey in the area of Asia Minor here. And I'm not sure if there's another country that would be today in that other area or not. I didn't take the time to look it up today. If anybody wants to look it up quickly on your cell phone or computer, let me know it, where Cappadocia and what country it would be today. Number three, what is true of them? But it's true, verse 2, is they are elect. They are elect. They're saved. They're God's special chosen people. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice, God the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus Christ are all mentioned. They're all involved in these individuals' lives. God the Father's involvement involved, in this case, foreknowledge, the Spirit's sanctification, Jesus the blood, speaking of his sacrificial death. How are they greeted? Verse 2, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Again, very similar New Testament greeting that Paul would give, but Peter is given it. You know, when people say, well, you know, Peter really wasn't grace-oriented, not true. They say, well, you know, Peter really didn't teach positional truth, not true. In fact, go, go to Galatia, go to 1 Peter 5. Go to 1 Peter 5 for a minute. Verse 12. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly. See, I like that again. Five chapters. Uh, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all who are in Christ. Jesus. That's positional truth, isn't it? Talks about the true grace of God. Talks about in Christ Jesus. Now it is true that he does confess in chapter 2 Peter 3 that Paul does write some things hard to be understood. But it's not to suggest for a moment that Peter wasn't grace oriented, though he had to become more and more, we know, just like we did or do. Number five, who assisted Peter in writing this epistle? We see there in chapter five, we just read it, verse 12, Silvanus, who's another name for Silas. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Because who's Silas? He's the guy who accompanied Paul in his second missionary journey. And now who's he hanging out with? Peter. It's interesting. By the way, is it okay to switch churches sometimes? Like to go in a different ministry, get involved? Yeah, he did. But in both cases, it was sound. Soundful. Number six, where was this letter written? It was written in Babylon slash Rome. Verse 13, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. And so does Mark, my son. Now, some people think 
it's literal Babylon. Others think it was written from Rome, which a code word for Rome would have been Babylon. I'm prone to think it was literal Babylon myself. You know why? Because I think Babylon means Babylon, unless you have a good reason not to. And I don't know a good reason not to. So I think he wrote it from Babylon. And I think he wrote it to literal Jewish Christians that were scattered abroad in various places that he identified. By the way, who's the she who is in Babylon? Elect together with you, greet you. Who's the she? Yeah, probably the church. Because the church is usually referred to as a bride of Christ and a she. In fact, even the word ecclesia means it's feminine. Do you know Spanish? What is the word for church? Iglesia. And the word a at the end means it's feminine. Feminine. Number seven, when was this letter written? That's a good question, but most think approximately about A.D. 64. A.D. 64. A lot of books of the Bible written in the 60s. Yes, Travis? They're children of the pilgrims of the dispersion, and this dispersion is just over time dispersion. Yeah. Not like the AD 70 type destruction. No, no it's clearly not talking about um, the destruction of Jerusalem. And by the way, in AD 70, with the destruction of Jerusalem, there was some dispersion that followed. You know, there was some. But no, uh, almost all Bible, conservative Bible teachers, teach that this clearly was before the destruction of the temple. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, but you remember there were persecution of Jews before, prior to that in the Roman Empire. Okay, next question. Um, you said that this book is written to Jews primarily, but yeah. he starts with grace and peace, and with Paul's apostles, you always said that grace was the Gentile greeting and peace was the Jewish greeting. Mm -hmm. Why would it not be the same here? Yeah, good question, yeah. I would answer it by saying, just because that was the normal Pauline greeting doesn't mean that it didn't become a common greeting, you know, among the Jews as well. And, and again, even with Jews, grace precedes peace. And so when Paul uses grace and peace, I'm not suggesting that, you know, he's greeting first the Gentiles, then he's greeting the Jews, then, you know, that it's all that's divided as much as it's all encompassing them as their audience. And so grace and peace would be a very appropriate greeting also for Jewish believers. You know, you don't have to be Gentile to hear grace mm -hmm. to you. So I would, you know, that's how I would answer that. And, and again, I think it became a very normal greeting, just like at the end of the book about greeting one another with a holy kiss. You know, that was normal. And until about the third century when they started to say, don't do that anymore. Apparently, somebody liked somebody else's kiss more than they should have. <laughs> and it didn't become a holy kiss anymore. So they quit doing that, actually, in churches. So some still have that. Okay, but good question. Further information on First Peter. By the way, let me go back to your question, too, Mark. Uh, similarities of stuff doesn't mean there aren't differences. Just because something's similar doesn't mean it's not different. You know, just like in dispensations, are there similarities in the different ages? But there's clearly the differences, too. Okay, the theme of this letter centers around suffering for Christ. That's what 1 Peter's all about. It's about suffering. And that's going to dominate because they were already suffering. In fact, if you look at 1 Peter chapter 1 with me, Let's begin in verse 3. Now keep in mind, verse 3 through verse 9 is one sentence. I'd like to diagram that one, huh? It's all one sentence. Sounds like Paul. But we know it's Peter. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm sorry, the sentence ends at the end of verse 5. Verses 6 through 9 yeah, is the second long sentence. But uh, notice this. Here are people that are in the dispersion. And getting dispersed, in some cases, due to persecution again, they probably lost their material things, right? They probably lost, in some case, approval of family. They've got relocated from their homes, their businesses, all these things. And what does he come on and say? Well, aren't you glad you've got something in heaven that's incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, it's reserved? And you know what? You're kept by the power of God through faith in the meantime, too. Wow, isn't that something? You got something that never be taken from you. You got something that's in heaven waiting for you. You know, what an encouragement to people who have suffered loss. Suffered loss. Now, it's interesting there in verses 3 through 5, that first sentence, what's the main subject and verb and object? I'll give you a minute and see if you can find it. Main subject, verb, and object. The word be, you see, is in italics. So it's not actually a verb. Mm -hmm. Has begotten us. God has begotten us again. God is the subject. Begotten again is the verb, and us is the... Everything you will read... And the rest of the verse centers around that. God is your father, and here you've been born again. And because God is your father, what do fathers do? They give inheritance to their children. And because you've been born into the family of God, he gave you inheritance too. That's incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, and is reserved in heaven for you in the future, who are being kept by the power of God in the meantime. Until you can finally enjoy your inheritance. But what's happened in the meantime, verse 6? In this, what is this in reference to? What's the antecedent to this? That's what he talked about, right? This heavenly inheritance. In this, you are greatly rejoicing. In the midst of your trials, can you be greatly rejoicing? What if you've suffered the loss of a lot of physical things? Can you still be greatly rejoicing? can. Though, now for a little while, temporarily, if need be, necessarily, you have been grieved emotionally, mentally, by various trials. Not just one, but a variety of them in light of this situation you're in. And the objective is that the genuineness or the refining of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory, which are an aspect of reward at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, guess what? You love him. Though now, you know, there, verse 8, that's a second sentence, isn't it? There's a period there after a while, isn't it? So verse 8 picks up the next sentence. Though now, you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith as salvation of your souls. And so they're going through very difficult trials. There's suffering going on. Look at chapter 3 with me. Verse 14. But sanctify the Lord God in your heart and be, always be ready in, to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
Look at chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, the suffering, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And he keeps talking about suffering. Look at chapter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Who's behind those sufferings by way of persecution is Satan himself. Verse 10, But may the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. You see, suffering for the Savior is what this book is all about. Now, in chapter 4, verse 15, he says, well, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. In other words, they're suffering, but that's for the wrong reasons. Verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. And so this book is really all about suffering. But suffering for the right reason. Suffering for the Savior. Suffering for doing the will of God. Not suffering because you're a jerk. Okay? The features of the letter are several. Number one, it's a practical letter addressing believers going through real-life trials. In fact, I believe 1 Peter more and more is going to be an epistle that Christians will be turning to as persecution and suffering increases in the Western world. Number two, it is a pastoral letter. And by that I mean Peter has the pastor, pastoral heart here. He's caring for these sheep. And by the way, is he a pastor? Look at chapter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder. And remember, what's an elder? An elder is a pastor. And what is he supposed to do, verse 2? They're there to shepherd the flock of God. What do elders do? They shepherd. They pastor. So he's expressing tremendous pastoral care in this letter. Number three, it points you repeatedly to Jesus Christ. Over and over again, you're going to read about Jesus and Christ and so forth and so forth. He's mentioned, he's referred to, his person is explained, his substitutionary death is explained, his resurrection is explained, his ascension is explained, his victory over the devil and his angels are mentioned. I mean, there's repeated references to Jesus Christ. And fourthly, it reminds you that Quote, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. And by the way, there's a textual, there's not a textual variant, it's a way of how to translate this. Pucci, can you bring up um, the um, ESV for a moment on that verse? More and more uh, people think this should be translated and testifying that this is the true grace of God dash, you stand. And that stand becomes this imperative. In other words, don't cave in. 5.12. Stand for a minute, okay? Now to stand firm, that's a command, isn't it? Stand for a minute. Stand firm in what? The grace of God. Stand firm, steadfast, stay steadfast, don't cave in, don't quit in the midst of your suffering, okay? What are the key verses? I'm going to give you a little break on this one, could have been many, just two, <laughs> four, verses 12 and 13, okay? Verses 12 and 13. And by the way, the key to memorizing verses is review, review, review. And to keep reviewing your old ones. 
say, man, I'm going to have a lot of verses memorized on this. So that's really good. I remember I had a personal evangelism class in Bible college in which I think we had to memorize probably a good 120 verses, personal evangelism. Say, bummer. Why did he ever have that class? Eh? Well, those are the key verses. Which, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice in the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Now watch this. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The glory of suffering is the same. The outline of 1 Peter, I'm taking it from the BTCP manual that you have, which is very similar to how I developed it in yesteryear. All S's. One, two, three, four, five, six. Too bad we couldn't get seven. After the introduction, it's about salvation. Then it's talking about being holy. What's another word for holy? Sanctified. And it talks about submission, talks about suffering, talks about service, talks about steadfastness. But the theme that's running through it is suffering. Is suffering. What are the interpretative challenges in 1 Peter? First of all, what does elect according to the foreknowledge of God mean? That's an interpretative challenge. Number two, what is the salvation of your souls referring to there? The end of your faith, the salvation of your souls? What is that referring to? Something you're going to have to work out. Number three, is the church spiritual Israel in light of the Jewish description of 2, 5 and 9 and 10? Go to chapter 2 for a moment. Whoever wrote 1 Peter sure knew the Old Testament. One, there's direct verses quoted. Number two, there's a lot of allusions. Look at 2, verse 5. You, are li you, are, you also as living stones are being built up a, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 9, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. You know, that's almost the exact wording of Deuteronomy. And there are those who argue the reason he's calling them that is because they're spiritual Israel. Another interpretative challenge is who are the spirits in prison? Chapter 3, verse 19. And if you listen to my message from a few Sundays ago, you know the answer to that question. I'm convinced they're angels. And I'll touch on that in 2 Peter as well. Now, what does 1 Peter 3.21 mean? Now, this is, I think, personally one of the most difficult verses in the Bible. And it falls on the heels of preaching to the spirits in prison. It's talking about verse 20. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which the few, that is, eight souls, were saved not by water but through the water. They were saved not from the water but through the water and they were saved by way of the ark. Now the ark is a type of salvation. Now, question, do types save? No. Not spiritually, anyhow. Now, if types don't save, do anti-types save? No. So if the ark is the type, what's the anti-type? Well, verse 21. There's also an anti-type which now saves us. Baptism. Now, there's debate. Is this spirit baptism? Is this water baptism? I know one person who takes a view, this is the baptism of the cup. 
Now that's a little different one. I never heard that one before. But you remember what the baptism of the cup is? It's suffering. First Peter is about suffering. But in what sense would the baptism of cup save you? How is that a anti-type? I don't know. That's why I don't. I don't believe that. See, I think the baptism there is water baptism. I think it is an anti-type of the ark. In other words, it's a picture of salvation. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. The word answer speaks of, again, something verbally expressed or by way of a testimony. And when you are getting baptized, you are picturing salvation and you're proclaiming. I have a good conscience toward God because of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I've been saved and I've been forgiven. Now, if you notice closely, you have in parenthesis not all the way how God, but if you notice, go back in a little farther, verse 18 is talking about what? The cross, right? Verse 19 is talking about what Jesus did between his death and his Resurrection. How does verse 21 end? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then what's the next verse? And he's gone into heaven. That's the ascension. And he's at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having made, been made subject to him. Now that's another reason why I take the view that the spirits in prison are angels. Because notice, He's at the right hand of God, and angels and authorities and powers are, have been made subject to him. And it was angels that he saw and preached to in 319, and the word spirits, as I pointed out before, and the New Testament, apart from a qualifier, is always in reference to angels. And the timing of that is verse 20, who formerly were disobedient. When once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah. So it's a tough passage. 321, I don't care how you cut it, it's a tough passage. But we know this, antitypes don't save. There's no other verse in scripture that says you have to be water baptized to be saved, so forth, so forth. So we know it's not saying that you have to be water baptized to be saved. And that's why the time good Bible teachers disagree on how to interpret this verse. I've known of some who have taken the spirit baptism view. I personally would like that. That's the one I'd like to take. The only problem is it's not a type. It's a reality. Spirit baptism isn't a type of salvation. It is salvation. When you get saved, you get baptized by the Spirit. That's not a type. That's a real thing. So I think, and plus, there's other things related to that that cause me to say, you know, I, I, I'd really like to take the spirit baptism view, but I, I just can't. The clear conscience at this point embrace that in light of the wording of the text. You see, at times we're prone to want to take the easy doctrinal view because it's easy. But we have to still be faithful to the words of the text. So the, I, I'm prone to think it's water baptism. If someone disagrees, that's fine. Okay. Another interpretative issue is he who suffered in the flesh. And by the way, that should be chapter 4, verse 1. Look there for a minute. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Who is the he? Is it Jesus Christ or is it the believer? Well, it talk about suffered in the flesh. You've got to remember 319, 318. Go back there for a minute. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death, in the flesh? 
So there are some who think that he is Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ suffered in the flesh, and therefore, and has ceased from sin, any relationship to sin. Therefore, we need to have that same mindset. Some interpret it that way. I'm prone to think it, it's, it's the believer. That because of verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time. Who's the he in verse 2? Clearly the believer, right? So I'm prone to think the he of verse 2 is the he of verse 1. So what does it mean that he ceased from sin in verse 1? And I understand that to mean he ceased from sin, not that he never sins, but he ceased making sin the target of his life. In other words, the reason he's suffering is he's going to call against the grain. Because look at what the rest of the verse says. Verse 3, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelings, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regards to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. So in other words, you're no longer running with the pack. You're going across the grain. And therefore, sin obviously isn't your target anymore. And thus, you're experiencing suffering. Now, here's another issue that you have to deal with, number seven, is what does it mean that the gospel is preached to the dead? Is that what it says in verse six? For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead. That's all it should have said. Preach to those who are dead. Really? The gospel is preached to dead people? What does that verse mean? I think that verse is saying the gospel was preached in the past to those who are now dead. And how did they die? In some cases, for their faith. And therefore, that they may be judged according to men, the unsaved, they view them as strange. Verse 4, why would you die for that? but they actually live according to God in the Spirit. That's the opposite. But that's a verse that one would have to address. It's an interpretative challenge in the book. Here's another one, number eight. Who, who is, that's bad. Well, you can tell I was, I was scurrying at this point. Who are the younger people referring to in 5.5? Five five? Likewise, you younger people. See, that's where we get our group, the young people, right there. Who are the younger people? I, I think the younger people are the congregation. That's my view. And they're to submit to your elders. Who are the elders in the passage? Older people only? No. Verse 1, the elders who are among you I exhort whom also an elder, what are you supposed to do? Shepherd the flock of God. So who are the elders in the passage? The spiritual leaders. So who, but the word elder does also mean mature, older people, right? So younger people is just a term that's used for the rest of the congregation. That's how I understand it. But you can see, you know, when you're working through scripture, there's a lot of, a lot of verses you have to kind of work out, huh? You have to study them out, you have to, interpret them. It's not like it's this easy slam dunk you just read in the yeah, of course. Everyone gets it, right? There's, you got to study to show yourself approved. And I'm thankful that I've had the privilege for so many years to, to be even financially supported so that I could devote thousands of hours to studying the text of scripture and studying these things out. Secondly, I'm very thankful for my books. I mean, some are worthless, but there's a lot that are good. And I'm just so thankful, even when I was studying out 2 Peter, and even the angels that sinned, even though I've taught that view for years and I have not changed, I was able to do some reading in some of my books. In fact, Arnold Fruchtenbaum's commentary on it was very helpful. You know, and uh, some other things. And as I'm reading this, I'm talking, but I am thankful for commentaries that actually address the problem passages instead of skipping them. 
And he was willing to do that, and I appreciate that. Don't always agree with Arnold on some interpretations, but people don't always agree with me. Okay, questions on First Peter. This question's from my brother. He's asking... Really? I'm surprised. Eric, <laughs> I've been waiting for you all night. <laughs> when you were talking about 321, did you say that a type does not save and therefore an anti-type does not save? Correct. Isn't an anti-type a fulfillment of a type? Yeah, it's not a fulfillment of a type. No, that's not how I look at it. It, it corresponds to a type. See, an anti-type, Eric is not a fulfillment of a type. It's a something that corresponds to a type. In fact, how does the New American Standard translate 1 Peter 3.21? Can one of you guys tell me? <laughs> Go to Bible Gateway or one of your programs. Or Okay, so in the New American Standard in 321, it doesn't even use anti-type, it just says corresponding to the type. So the idea of, of the anti-tupos is actually the Greek word where you get anti-type, and that is the word. And the New American Standard is trying to, it corresponds to. It isn't necessarily, Eric, a fulfillment of. But good question. Okay, other questions you might have. First Peter. You remember what the trigger words are? The glory of suffering. Four words, okay? And what are the key verses? First Peter 4, 12 and 13. The glory of suffering. Okay? Very good. We're going to take a three-minute break. <laughs>